how's everybody doing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, same, same, bro, same. I'm back to my drinking cider or just beer or whatever, usually cider. While I record this podcast in the evenings, I pretend it's a whole less mood while it's actually a coping mechanism. You know, I've heard a new, learned a new word today. Have you heard of the word corny? Yeah, as in quarantine. And then what would the second word be that merges into that word? Horny. Yeah, internet is just brilliant, isn't it? So yeah, I hope you never get to use that word. Actually, I did discover one brilliant thing this week and it has nothing to do with quarantine. Well, it kind of does. Well, I don't actually know. Okay, it's a Twitter account. I don't know where I read it. I kind of forgot what the handle is. Anyways, let me still tell you about it. You might know. <laughs> Please remind me of what this Twitter account is. If I remember, I'll put it in the description box. There's this guy that basically develops bots, as in non-human bots. And he trains it to like listen to these weird things and then like write up a script. He did it for like different shows, but he also did it for a true crime podcasts, and it was so eerily good. Like it literally even has like hosts and then clips that are included into it. So basically, yeah, one day a bot might steal even this job from me. So um, that's just if you needed any positive news this week. Hi, I'm Maya. This is by all means necessary. It's a podcast. It's true crime and a comedy mix. And if there is a word corny, there should be a word called comedy. Yeah, because all of us comedians. Why, why did you say all of us like I'm a comedian? Everybody who like thinks they're funny now, they're struggling. Even if you never made money of it, your quarantine jokes are just different. They're not comedy, they're comedy. They're at that level. You're like at the best smiling. You're never just fully laughing at it. Okay, cool. Depressing. Great, great stuff, Maya. I usually like to say that this is an uplifting podcast, but <laughs> good. Diving into this motherfucker today, to end the month of the art heists, of course, I had to cover this one, because the internet just doesn't allow you not to cover this art heist, because it's everywhere, it's the biggest one, so... Yeah. Also, it's unsolved, and if I ever hated unsolved true crime cases, I hate unsolved art heists ten times more. So boy, am I gonna simplify the shit out of this case. Also, this one beats me to, you know, like I just started making conclusions by doing two art heists, so smart. But I just started being like, okay, I, I can kind of get a crack on the motive, I can get a crack on motivations. This one just defies it too. I was like, there was no respect. The prevalent thing in this case is there's just no respect to art. And yes, I know that last time I compared Mona Lisa to Martha Stewart, so I shouldn't be complaining about that part. But some of the art that they have stolen in this case, a Mona Lisa man, some of this thing is so beautiful. Okay, you, you need to look up. I'm gonna put everything on social media, but you need to look up some of these paintings. They are gorgeous. Started butchering words, let's dive in, it's time. On March 18th, 1990, Boston's Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum was robbed by two thieves dressed as police officers. They made off with 13 famous paintings and sculptures, representing a value of more than 500 million. This remains the largest property theft in the US history, where charges have been avoided for 30 years by all means necessary. What were the motives behind the heist? Now, going into the shoes, or, well, you can choose, actually. You can be a guard here, or you can be a thief. Which one you wanna be? Because we have details on both. So you choose. Choose wisely. This is a game, and three, two, one. have you chosen your player? Good, let's proceed. In this heist, there were two guards on the shift. A guy named Rick Abbav, who I'm gonna call Rick, because he's just cooler than Abbav. He was making rounds, so he was just, you know, doing his guard thing. You know how much I respect and love guard jobs. They're super interesting and exhilarating. So he was just walking around the museum, doing his rounds. The museum was shut. It was a night shift. They started at like 11.30 p.m. While another guard, Hestend, was hanging out at the security desk. You know, probably like, just chilling. Didn't expect a thing. They're in their mid-twenties. And something that will most probably change in the future. They didn't have any, like, formal security training. 
The guy that's at the desk, Kesten, was a New England conservatory student, and he used his downtime, his leisure time, to practice his trombone. Rick, Rick Abbav, played in a rock band, and he was known to occasionally just show up to work drunk or stoned. He had a full look going on. We're gonna talk a lot about Rick. But just for visualization purposes, he had like really long, curly, all, all curly hair. Had a weird rock band where, you know, he couldn't like match up the clothes. So on this particular evening, he was wearing like red pants. And just had that stoner look, scruffy beard, long brown hair, would walk with like unbuttoned t-shirts even in the museum. So yeah, it was definitely a look. Another thing you should note is that the Isabella Garner Museum didn't have security cameras in its galleries. It just had motion detectors that recorded up a smooth and so as he's doing his rounds. And at one point that evening, an alarm on the fourth floor went off, but up of check, nothing seemed to be amiss. So around 1 a.m. he has walked through this museum, you know, he has done his 10k steps and he's like, cool, let's switch places, Heston, you do the patrolling. Around 1.24 a.m., while Abbaf was the only one at the security desk, at the entrance of the museum, two Boston police officers approached the side entrance and they asked to be let in. So what does Rick do? Rick buzzes them in. Now these police officers are in and they are explaining to Rick that they have received reports of disturbance, they needed to ask the guard some questions, you know, just to check if these disturbance claims are correct. And Rick calls to Randy and says, like, Randy, can you please come to the desk, like, finish your rounds, you know, let's answer these police officers' questions. This is when it gets a bit strange, because these police officers lie to them and, and tell Randy that Rick was actually a suspect for a crime that they're investigating. And now if you imagine it, so Randy has just come from doing his rounds and Rick is behind the desk, so they signal to Rick, like, you know, come here, like, we need to handcuff you and bring you to, like, the police station. And what Rick does is now moves away from that security desk. And by moving away from the desk, he also moved away from the only panic alarm, the only way he could signal the outside world, because, again, there were no cameras. This is when these two police officers handcuff the two guards and then tie them and move them to the basement of the museum. They were in that museum for about 81 minutes. There is a good podcast on this called Last Scene by the Boston Globe, and they do it in like 10 part series where they cover the actual heist. So the first episode is called 81 Minutes, where they cover the heist, and then they focus on all these different aspects. Cool, so now the guards are in the basement. If you chose the wrong player, you're in the basement now. Cool. <laughs> Just saying, decisions matter. And if you chose the thieves, you continue with the game. And the motion detectors are recording your every move as you're moving through the museum. There are floor plans of this online. I'm just gonna, you know, summarize it because it's basically they stole art from about two rooms. Most of the art is stolen from the Dutch room. This is where they cut Rembrandt's work from. They took a lady and gentleman in black. They removed Vermeer's The Concert. That is the most beautiful thing. Like, Jesus, that's the one thing that you need to respect, okay? Vermeer's The Concert. So visually appealing. They took Fling's landscape with an obelisk. And they even pulled an ancient Chinese bronze goose, so this beaker from the table. And as they're moving, the motion sensor logs... How would I describe this? You know how when you write a telegram and it's like, information dot stop, information dot stop. So they, it kind of logs, someone is in the Dutch room, investigate immediately, and then timestamp, and then again, someone is in the Dutch room, investigate immediately, timestamp, but again, the, there's no communication with the outside world, so this is going to be the evidence only in the aftermath of this robbery. As I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, they completely disregarded this art. Like, they did not care about preserving it at all, as the other two people I spoke about this month did. So, when they took the storm on the Sea of Galais, so uh, that's the Rembrandt's one, and the lady and gentleman in back, they threw them on the marble floor, so that would shatter the glass frames and then they would take the actual painting out. The way they would take the painting out is that they would use a blade to cut the canvases out of the stretchers. They also removed another Rembrandt's painting, and that is the self-portrait of him. So that's the old painting. They removed it from the wall, but they left it leaning against the cabinet. And investigators in the aftermath believe that they may be considered too large to transport. And that's potentially because, as an oil painting, it was painted on wood, so it might not be as durable as, like, the others that were painting on the canvas. 
However, remember this part because I feel it's important that they try to take another Rembrandt or that they have done this to another Rembrandt. As a thief now, you're moving from the Dutch gallery to the short gallery that's on the same floor as this Dutch room. Sorry, let's just call it Dutch gallery. <laughs> cool, I'm inventing names, great. Where five Degas drawings and this bronze eagle finial were stolen. What the fuck is finial? Again, interesting because they are not just stealing paintings. It kind of seems to me like at first when I read this that this was super random and I mean investigators have like just speculations as well. But it just seems like they didn't really come there with a mission of like, yep, yeah, let's steal these paintings in particular. Let's just steal everything that catches an eye. Oh, there's a Chinese vase. Oh, there's an eagle. Let's take it. Now you're moving into the blue room and you are taking Monet's Chairs Tortoni. So that's the only one that was taken from the blue room. However, this is interesting because the motion detectors didn't actually show that anybody entered this room. Which kind of again is interesting because were there different heists that evening? The only detection that they picked up in that room was when Rick was doing rounds earlier on that evening. According to the motion detectors, the thieves spent about 34 minutes in the galleries and you could kind of also spot that they were going in and out twice, so they made two trips to the cars to, to transport the goods. As they prepared to leave, they checked on the guards one last time and they just asked them are they comfortable? Like, sure. Again, there are pictures of the guards online, so if you chose that as your player, you are right now, let me just pick trade for you, your eyes and face technically well you can breathe but like it's all taped with that gray freaking tape that you know that's just gonna kill your hair once they untape you it's just gonna pull out shit ton of your long ass curly hair your hands are wrapped behind you again just taped with that freaking gray tape you're looking like a rock star stuck in a basement like peter davidson stuck with his mom just kidding Kidding, love for Pete Davidson. I want another special, I need comedy special by Pete Davidson's every time. So they checked on the guards, then moved to the security director's office where they took these video cassettes that recorded the entrance to the museum and they took the printouts from this motion detective equipment. However, they left a the hard drive, so everything was still technically recorded somewhere. Now they technically leave something that people have called a calling card because it was the frame from the chest or tourney and it was left at the securities director's desk. Then they do those two outside trips, so the detectors again noted the side entrance door opening at 2.40 am and again last time at 2.45 am. And that's it, they disappear technically without a trace. At around 6.45, supervisor arrives because they have tried to establish contact basically with the guards and, well, nobody was responding at the security desk, so they came early to check up what the hell is up. Because this was a huge ass museum, because they realized it was a robbery, so they were inspecting the rooms, they only found guards at around 8.15 am. On to the aftermath of the event. So obviously the first thing to note and the first thing that detectives noted was that that first floor where the blue room was, well, that the motion detectors weren't activated. And that that wasn't a mistake. So immediately they started thinking like, well, Manet was definitely stolen. It was definitely in that room. So was this an inside job or were there multiple heists? They immediately also involved the big guns, so one of the prominent names in this story is gonna be Anthony Amore, who was the chief investigator of the Gardner Museum. And he said immediately what struck investigators is that thieves probably didn't know too much about art, because they didn't steal the most expensive piece, and that was the painting which remained untouched in another gallery. What struck him as curious is that they went straight for Rembrandt, which is the most stolen artist. And what everybody in this story, like every single article, is like the Monet, the Monet, which I get why it's like intriguing and especially it's like a fuck you moment because you leave it as like a calling card and they can't figure out why the motion detectors weren't working in that room. But what I see when I read this story in every single article, I see tunnel vision which you can't have as a detective, as a police officer. Because everybody's like, well, why didn't they take it? Why didn't the motion detectors work? It's a small oil painting. It's only 10 by 13 inches. It would be like really easy to steal, really light. 
why go through the effort? Like the robbery might have even lasted for for a shorter time. Why go through the effort to actually cut it out with the blade from the canvas like the others, but then just leave it as this calling card? And then as they're investigating this, obviously, again, what they are thinking is it took a significantly longer time. Like, even when we think about, okay, I mean, the last guy, the Mona Lisa dude, literally spent the night in the closet, okay, he doesn't count. But usually, the art thefts, or just thefts in general, are like a matter of time. They're speedy motherfucking processes. Usually, actually, art thefts are less than three minutes. Remember the first one, the scream one, that literally took like 60 seconds. This one lasted almost an hour and a half. So everybody's thinking, how did the thieves know that they had so much time? And why leave the most valuable one, Titian's Rape of Europa, which art historians have called one of the most important examples of Renaissance art? Surely, as a thief, you want to go for the most expensive art piece, because the whole point is, if you're doing it for monetary reasons, you can sell it then. However, as I mentioned, even after all these years, they have only had suspects. There was nobody actually really even in prison for it. And they obviously haven't found who has done the, the robbery. And by now, well, the thieves are probably dead. But also the statute of limitations ran out in 1995. And even the investigators actually promised publicly not to prosecute anyone who admits having the paintings by now. As long as they return, they're like, we are desperate. And if you go to the museum now, the empty frames are still hanging where the masterpieces were once displayed. Now let's go into the most confusing history in the world of just the suspects and the conclusions of who could have done this. Well, the first one is pretty obvious. All right, well, just to summarize this whole investigation, it had about 30,000 leads, hunches, just different forensic tests, and they have obviously taken fingerprints. It had psychics call in, jailhouse confessions, interviews with drug dealers, with the mafia members, with museum guards, with museum directors, with retired police officers, just different art dealers from all around the world. And although the artwork has been estimated for some time to be worth 500 million, because of how the art market works, which I cannot explain, but yeah, the price would have raised significantly. So right now, this would be at least worth 1 billion dollars. The Vermeer's concert, you know, the one that I said is super beautiful, it's gorgeous, that alone is worth nearly 500 million. And even though still, again, no names have been named as actual perpetrators, the FBI announced in 2013 that they knew who was responsible for the museum heist, but would not reveal the names because they were dead. <laughs> this is just like, it's like honor amongst the thieves. Like, you, you're the FBI, you should actually tell people if you really know, but do you really know? Even if they know, they don't know where the paintings are. So, what's the point? So let's roll back up to just after the theft. So obviously they would take fingerprints, but however, they left the place open to the public. So th that could have all been mixed. It could have been somebody else's fingerprints as well. You need to close off the crime scene. And in this case, the crime scene is the whole ass museum. But pretty much that's it. They would interview the guards. They focused a lot on Rick, which I'm going to go through, but for four years they didn't have any further leads once they would like discard all of the suspects until four years after the heist they would get a typed ransom letter it asked for 2.6 million in ransom and if they want to accept they should publish one so number one in the boston globe foreign exchange section listing for lira so you know how the foreign exchange is like okay on this date lira is worth one dollars and the FBI and the police actually did that. However, the letter writer might have gotten spooked, thinking that the police was now involved and not just the museum guards. So they backed out and they never heard from them again. So they backed out and the only letter back that they wrote said you can have the paintings or make an arrest, not both. Also, as in plenty of these heists, the reward was offered. And because... I'll talk about this in the background, but the museum was actually not doing financially well just before this heist. So the trustees, so the board of trustees actually kind of managed to offer the 5 million reward, but only in 1997, which again would mean the statute of limitations has passed. However, that doesn't lead to, again, any arrests or 
any more substantial suspects. So let's go through a couple of suspects. Number one suspect and the number one theory in general is that this was an inside job. And this is based on the stats, which again, if you think about it, it is the most logical conclusion. It's security guards, you know, they know the museum, they would know how to nick it, they would know exactly like all the flaws in the security system, so everybody focused on Rick above. And well, his whole image didn't really help the guy, so he also was very famous for having parties on mushrooms in this museum. And what also didn't go into his favor is that he resigned two weeks before the robbery. So they were like, yeah, okay, so he's out. So he's like, yep, this is my last goodbye. (laughs) You know how I used to write dramatic resignation emails? (laughs) The one email I wrote, that was so good. God, that was so good. I wrote a freaking essay and then I had attachments. I was like, these are my receipts. This is how shitty this company is. And I sent it to like 15 people. <laughs> have they done anything about it? No, you can bet no. But I was like, I have my receipts. I have had my say. Goodbye. So they thought like, you know, he was pulling a resignation Maya. And then what mostly didn't go into his favor is that motion detector that didn't detect anybody else there during the robbery. But then they're like, okay, we actually need evidence to support this theory. So they look into the security footage on like the days preceding the robbery because what he has said okay the, i'm not explaining this right the main point is that they have been trained like the little training that they have had should have taught them not to open that door at night to anybody and they mean anybody like doesn't matter if it is police officers don't open it but rick here is like well why actually open it and Rick was like, well, they actually never mention in the training. <laughs> that is my also my favorite move. It's like, no, 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 I'm blaming it on you. You didn't train me well. You did not train me well. Mm-mm-mm. I have never heard about that. <laughs> That's my favorite thing. It's like, I'm just after the training. It's like, no, it's not my memory. Mm-mm. I remember everything. I take everything. I sponge it all. No, it's your fault. And he also said that what he does is he opens and shuts the door every night to check if it works. <laughs> it's a door. If it, it's automatic, it, it should work, right? You don't have to check on it. So they're like, okay, you weirdo. <laughs> now what we're going to do is we're going to check the surveillance. And what did they know the night before? He also let somebody in. That person's identity is protected. That person also worked for like the security of the museum. But again, this is not the protocol because they're supposed not to let anybody in after hours. Obviously, during this investigation, they have taken digs at the actual fact of, like, who are these guards? They're musicians. Like, one is playing trombone, one is this rock musician. Like, they are guarding millions and millions in art. Why? Why are they not, like, art aficionados? Why are they not, like, curators? Somebody who actually cares about art and wants to protect it and takes the security seriously. Hey guys, you might not have noticed, but I was actually missing for about an hour and a half <laughs> when I recorded a YouTube video. Lols. <laughs> Literally stood up in the middle of this suspect thing. I was like, this is some bullshit. Leave musicians alone. <laughs> Just drank some more side and recorded the whole last YouTube video. So ain't that something. <laughs> this guy is a true G though. Like he used to do stuff that we used to do at one of my workplaces previously where we'd just have like a party after hours. Nobody was monitoring us, they didn't care. So this guy would even bring his friends to the museum after hours for like New Year's Eve party. Well, so this guy is my true hero. I don't care. I don't care if he was the perpetrator, even if he stole all of this art, because his excuses are just like a fifth grade kind of excuses. As I told you, well, one of his excuses I already told you. But the second one, they were like, okay, why the hell did you move from the only panic alarm, from the only source, you dumbass? You let people in, which is also against the protocol, but okay, you're not trained on that. Why did you move from like the panic attack button? panic attack button boy don't i wish i had that Mm -hmm. it's just like once you know i'm overwhelmed get a panic attack and just press the button and it all goes away life doesn't work that way does it so he said he followed the instructions because he didn't want to get arrested because he had tickets to attend this grateful dead concert later that day this genius he's like listen i didn't care about this shit 
to begin with. Then they like, okay, cool. So what about the motion sensors? You know, are you the one that stole this pain? <laughs> no, that's ridiculous, of course. But then they were like, okay, even before they were to come in, you actually opened the side entrance door. And this is where he came up with a bullshit thing where he was like, well, I actually opened that door to check if it works every day. <laughs> And then they're like, okay, cool, we'll check the security. And they're like, oh, you just let people in there to party every freaking day. Genius. Rick. Rick. Honestly, the more booze I have, the more I empathize with these suspects. Remember that Jeffrey Dahmer case when I was like, he was a torso lover. He was so hot. God. Alcohol really changes my perspective of the hot or not. <laughs> cool. Now, the second set of suspects. I'm gonna simplify this thing. There was basically like this whole... Boston gang thing. They were called the Merlino crew. So the FBI was actually more concerned about the mob than Rick Abbott themselves. The police was kind of like, yeah, this might be an inside job. Whereas the FBI was like, mm, this kind of looks like a mob to us. To which, okay, this, I don't know why, but this is the most bizarre thing for me. Like, I know, you know, the Godfather and all of that, like all of these portrayals. Yes, they have like this sick art in the background. But for me, when I think mafia, when I think mob, my first thing is like some, you know, contraband, jewelry maybe, you know, having those like nice rings, you know, some Rolexes, like, and then kind of art. Art is kind of like the 10th thing on the list where I would think about like showing off your wealth. And this mob, I don't know why for me that just didn't seem that deep rooted. It didn't give me, you know, what the hell is that one with Richard Kuklinski? Or like Bugsy Seagull, it didn't give me that type of mafia where it was like so deeply rooted that they would be like, no, we are going this specific. They were basically, this mob operated from like a car repair shop, of course. This was like a cover-up. Nobody, none of them knew how to fix cars. So the FBI actually had to have an interview with a prison informant who was part of this mob and he was called Carmelio Merlino. Because he would just boast that he planned to recover the artwork and collect the reward. So once they caught him for this robbery of cars, the FBI was like, okay, we're gonna be super lenient, however, you just return us the stolen artwork, and he never produced it, and now he's dead, he died in prison in 2005. Then the FBI was focusing on a different pair of mobsters, and those were Melino's associate, George Ricefeider and Leonard Di Muzio. The first one died of cocaine... <laughs> cocaine... <laughs> Cocaine, cocaine, <laughs> died of coke overdose and Dimuzio died because he was shot in East Boston. So the FBI believed that they are one of the robbers that was robbing banks with this lot, called Robert Guarente, was the one who actually ended up taking over these paintings. So, you know, they were all planned the robbery, the two of them stole it and then gave it to Guarente guy. And they believe this because once Guarante died, all of them are fucking dead, his wife told the FBI that before his death, he gave two stolen paintings to these Connecticut mobsters. It's just like mobsters and mobsters here. Robert Gentile. And now the FBI is like, who the hell is this Gentile guy? Let's look into him. He was eight years old at the time and in jail awaiting trial on federal gun charges. So the, they're like, okay, cool, this is great, because then we can, again, play leniency card, like, listen, Gentile dude, we're gonna let you out of the prison. Come on, confess, fess up, somebody just tell us the name. But Gentile says he knows nothing. He's literally like, I'm almost dead. Like, yes, I would like leniency, but I genuinely have no idea what you're on about. Again, I feel like somebody would fess up on their literally deathbed if they were to have stolen the art, so they would claim it, because... It's a mobster. They would be like, yeah, it was me. Like, the hell do you mean? Like, yeah, I stole that one billion dollars worth. Because by then you're like, yeah, I'm gonna take the fame. I've seen Ocean 13 or whatever, however many there are there. There was another part of this crew who was called David Turner. And people speculated that he was the one behind because he was serving like a separate sentence on different offense. But his 38-year sentence was reduced to just 7 years, so people were speculating that the judge has done this in return for the information connected to the stolen paintings. However, again, there were no arrests made. The third suspect that we're gonna talk about is, again, a crime boss in Boston. Boston apparently famous for crime, didn't know that. His name is Whitey Bulger. 
So this one kind of goes that deep where I can be like, okay, I can kind of get it because, well, this guy wanted credit because he was basically saying like it was committed on his turf. And you know how these raccoons, is it goddamn raccoons? I used to know that. No, coyotes, coyotes, yes. 90% sure it's coyotes, probably not. What am I on about? Yeah, you know, in biology lesson, they taught us that the coyotes always piss to claim their territory. Might not be coyotes. This might be completely pointless. This might not teach you anything, this fact. But yeah, that's that's how mobsters are. They they piss on the turf. They're like, this is my turf. I don't care who committed it. It was committed on my turf. So technically, this is my tribute. You tribute me for it. And people heavily believe that because Bulger had strong ties to the Boston police. And who entered to rob the people? Yeah, they might be wearing the police uniform, which again is easy to supply if you have ties to the police, or what if they were actual police officers. Now enter Charlie Hill, remember him from the first episode of this month, the screen, yes, the Charlie Hill here, Scotland Yard, UK. So what he has speculated is that, remember the calling card, you know, well, well, the calling painting technically. He said that uh, Paltrow most probably actually gave this these works to Gardner, who was part of the Irish Republican Army or the IRA. So he believes that the works are most likely in Ireland. But Amore and the FBI kind of believe that there's no evidence of the paintings have actually trespassed and like are in Ireland now. There was this whole episode on last scene where the FBI has speculated, has actually given statements that they believe the art went to Connecticut and then Philadelphia, and they believe Philadelphia is where it actually was, well, where it is actually now. But again, they said that they can't give us the name of the people because they're dead, so if they're dead, why not give us the name of the people? The last theory we're going to talk about today is a saga that came from the journalism bit. Again, journalists come to shit on your parade every time. <laughs> hey, my colleagues that studied with me, I respect our profession. Why, why am I drinking? Why? Why? <laughs> I say things that I can't take back. They're on the internet forever. These suspects are called Miles Connor and William Youngworth. So the investigators thought that they have finally caught a break on August 27th, 1997, when this front page headline screamed at people, we've seen it. And the Boston Herald wrote that their reporter had been shown Rembrandt's storm on the Sea of the Galley, like one of the famous ones, right? And the, by the most stolen artist, Rembrandt. So they wrote this whole article where they're like, yeah, there was a glow of flashlight and the painting was pulled out, like showed to the reporter by this informant during the pre-dawn hours. It was like, you know, they have arranged this whole town to be like, yeah, we have it. But apparently it was a replica. So yeah. And the person that has shown it to uh, the reporter was Youngworth, who was a Brighton antique dealer. And he was after the reward and also after the dismissal of the charges that he had. And he also wanted his mate Miles Connor released from prison on a different federal drug charges. I'm sorry if you hear a set of screaming children in the background. The walls are thin in the UK. I don't understand why either. Yeah, there's like, a, I don't know, a house party, but there it's led by children. It's the worst kind of house party. That's what is happening like right next door to me. Why did they never pursue this? Well, because they confirmed this replica. Remember the first two stories of the month? There's always a stamp. There's always a proof that the painting is original. And the seascape on this particular painting before the tap was covered with this protective coating to help preserve it. What would that mean is that it would make it impossible to roll it up. And well, what was shown here by young Youngworth was roll the fuck up. I put the next line, I swear, I write these scripts in the weirdest, weirdest mood. It's like, yeah, just before sleep, I put painting not flexible. <laughs> so I was actually really intrigued here, so I made kind of this section before going to the background. I mean, there's more suspects, by the way. You can listen to last scene, you can research this, it's on their website, it's everywhere. If you want to know more suspects, but yeah, it's mostly like some mob and like crime bosses. So what I was intrigued by is what would happen if the art is ever found? What would happen is they would bring it to the museum, they'd try to keep a low profile, they would authenticate it, so each and every art, like what made it original, something that only 
the museum curators would know. They then restore it because obviously how many years have passed? I can't do math. Don't make me do math. Then they would announce the news. And then based on like if all of the paintings are returned, they would still kind of like think of what they should reduce the reward money. Or if all of them are, they would just disperse they sell a million in reward money and they would just give it to other causes, use it for museum, actually restore the thing. And then they would display them and fill those frames with that beautiful, beautiful art. God. Okay, let's go into the background. It's So I thought it's interesting to think about the museum in general. As I mentioned, it was really low on funds back in the day, in the 1980s. However, after this obviously was uncovered, they had to pull out some funds and actually invest in security. So now it's not as easy to rob the rest of the paintings because they have 60 infrared motion detectors. And they also have the closed circuit television system consisting of four cameras placed around the building's perimeter. Again, because it is too pricey, they didn't install the cameras within. And I feel if there is one learning curve for everybody that listened to this, I covered only three cases. Only three cases this month. We, I should not know about this security. Like, I should not be aware about what security exists in this random ass museum having millions and millions of art. It's like people in these cases are giving statements with like, yeah, you know, like, yeah, th- this one is heavy, this one, yeah, weighs 100 kgs, mm-hmm. the cameras, there, there are 10 cameras in this, like, what are we doing? But why it has happened is because there are no regular checkpoints. It's a museum, again, you need to have regular checkpoints, like fail-safe systems, that require these night watchmen to make, like, hourly phone calls to the police. Or just somebody else to be like, hey, yep, all is well, all is good, checking in. And what this investigation uncovered is that they were paying just above the minimum wage, so obviously they couldn't attract anybody who was actually interested in art or like somebody higher qualified. Which again just provided like another inside joke among the guards. Okay, controversial opinion, but do you think like in your companies everybody should be allowed to refer a friend? Like, I know certain companies, like, I know the usual rule is, like, wait until they pass probation and prove themselves. But still, sometimes they bring the same, same culture. Like, I had that problem where somebody would just, yeah, refer all of their mates. And then it's like, yeah, a bunch of exactly this, a bunch of musicians just guarding the art that have no interest. Or just don't care, and then they're just having the banter among themselves and nobody else gets it. And you're like, great. Now a bit about the victims. Obviously there was like 13 pieces of art, so I'm just gonna keep it really brief. The concert by Johannes Vermeer. So this was painting in 1600s and this is so beautiful and it's famous for being super symmetrical and just, just in general, just gorgeous motherfucking painting, okay? And this one is particularly painful not just because of how pretty it is, how small it is and therefore easy to steal. It's generally considered the rarest and the most valuable of all of these lost treasures. And that's because partly few of his paintings are known to exist. The current consensus is there's 37 over Mir's paintings, but scholars, hey scholars, they <laughs> shout out to scholars yet again. This month was run by scholars. Promo code SCHOLARS. They have doubts about the genuineness of the three of them. So they're like, okay, 34, maybe 37. (laughs) Imagine how different the 13 going on the 30 would be if it's just 34 going on 37. (laughs) It's like nothing changed. You are the same old cunt. Why are we even having this movie? Wow, yeah, you you heard it here first. Don't steal this genius idea about a movie from me. No, no, this is my production. 34, going on 37, let's do it. Next one is a lady and gentleman in black, and that's Rembrandt's painting. This is a super large, it's like a famous one, once you see it you'll know which one it is, but it's 4 feet high. And what's striking is kind of the position of the two figures. So on the right you see this woman sitting on this like elegant chair, looking up, she's not looking directly at you, she kind of seems like modest. And in the center, you see this man who is just standing, towering over her, swaggering. (laughs) Swaggering, yes, Maya, queen. 
and it's just I don't know for me it kind of leaves that mystique I mean for me it's kind of sexist but again it <laughs> leaves that mystique of like where they're looking why is he looking at me why is she not where is she staring at is she submissive to him what is going on it's huge and it's somehow unsettling I don't like it Oh, by the way, if you don't want to sleep tonight, watch Unhinged. It's it's worth it. Go to the cinema and watch that movie. I was sweating. My palms were sweating throughout that whole movie. It's great. Because just as you calm down, it, it kind of like it doesn't let you calm down. It's this thriller about loss. <laughs> it's just like, fuck this art. I somehow showed more respect to art than these fucking teams this month, like, even though I just, like, completely neglected and tell you a personal story. But yeah, unhinged, Russell Crowe and some pretty lady, anyways. <laughs> it's a guy on a killing spree that's terrorizing this woman that passed him on, the, like, at a crossing by a car, and he's now killing everybody in her life because he stole her phone. Anyways, yeah, it's great. Another Rembrandt's painting, Christ in the Storm of the Sea of Galilee. This one is famous, so he painted this one the same year as he painted the other one. But this one is like more dramatic, more dynamic. And it's again over 5 feet high. It's technically like almost what? My size? Why am I? 5'11". Okay, not exactly, but you know. <laughs> you know what I mean. It's hard to steal, so they really went for Rembrandt. Then again, this is becoming repetitive, Rembrandt. There's a portrait of the artist as a young man. So this is like his self-portrait. And it just, again, it's a portrait. Nothing special about it. But it's tiny. It's like one inch wide and two inches high. <laughs> this article is actually killing me. He's a little pudgy, a little scraggly. His hair is tousled and unkempt. And he looks very serious. Just like your girl here podcasting, yes. Then there is landscape with obelisk, on which I have nothing. It apparently didn't strike me as anything special, Jesus. Then there's the chest of Tony by Manet. And this one again, you must have seen it in like arts classes somewhere. I have no clue where I've seen this thing, but it's this mustachioed young man wearing this top hat and sitting in a cafe. So this is a small painting that was hanging in the blue room. And I don't know, I find it particularly striking that this particular one was left as the calling guard, because the guy is kind of staring directly at you and like just drinking wine, enjoying his like cafe. But it's kind of like, I don't know, the, the, the eye, it's kind of that eye contact that you make with somebody when you're like mean mugging them, you're like, mm, wh what do you want? I think I'm reading you into this, also had about you side this by now, so I can see an art piece and just describe it for you, and you will not see it. You will not. And the one that was stolen from the short gallery was Five Works on Paper by Edgar Degas. So some of these are like pencil sketches, then just like the colored ones, then charcoal sketches, and just by looking at them, pretty random ones to steal. I'm just trying to think, like, what was their logic? Because I can understand why you want to steal the most stolen artist, like Rembrandt, or why you want to steal, like, Vermeer, because it's, like, famous for different things. But then there's, like, so many random ones. Going on to even more random ones, the Bronze Eagle Finial. Finial, because I didn't know what the hell it is, the Oxford Dictionary defines it as an ornament at the top and or corner of an object. So this eagle thing, right, had this decorative top which had like a flagpole to which there was a flag that was attached from Napoleon's first regiment of Imperial Guard. All of they tried, so they knew how much they spent like with every single painting, they couldn't remove the entire flag. And that's when they set up the finial. So again, here is the only painting where they actually put some effort into it. Well, if you discount the calling card, Manet. But again, I'm like, do you maybe not care as much for the art as for these little bits, like this vase and this eagle thing? And they're just stealing art for the sake of that not being noticeable? So the finial is gone, but the flag is still there. And we come to the last piece, which is the ancient Chinese Gu. And this particular vase was actually made between 1200 and 1100 BC. So this is before Christ stuff, man. This is some... Uh, blasphemia. It's one of blasphemia. I can... I, <laughs> this is a fucking blasphemy. Just don't steal ancient things. This one hurts me, man. It belonged to the ancient Shang dynasty. 
and the collector and the founder of, muse of the museum, Mrs. Gardner, bought it in 1922 for 17,500. She placed it in the Dutch room, and it was just to the right of the stolen uh, Rembrandt's seascape. It's just so elegant and nice. Why are you steal it? So that's kind of like a rundown on the paintings. Now let's actually go and discuss what could have motivated whoever was behind this heist. Well, as I mentioned, like literally, <laughs> it's like so biased, but throughout this whole podcast episode, I feel they went straight for Rembrandt, like, well, from the motion sensors, we know that, but also it's, I feel like it was a particular purpose that they have done that and have stolen two of Rembrandt's works, well, or three, was it free? And that's because he was the most often stolen artist. And that, I mean, even if you're a thief, even if you know nothing about the art, then why else would you steal multiple pieces from the most stolen artist? Why not go for the most expensive ones, the Rape of Europa? Unless you want to be known as the person that again managed to stole multiple works by Rembrandt. Because as we know, if he, he maxed, did 37. So now people are gonna be scared, people are gonna be on the lookout if you go and try to steal the rest of them. And also in like the art community, then you're known as the person that's able to again steal the most often stolen artist. He was most often stolen artist at the time, but he was beaten by Picasso. That was me giving you the time to actually, you know, think of an answer. I love how this article was like, but then Picasso did produce more work. It's like, it's not fair. Let's just, let's just be fair here. So now I have a question for you. If you were to be in Thieves shoes, right? You are a thief right now. Would you go for the most worth or would you go for the most stolen? Because I think that's the preliminary thing here. And obviously I'm of the belief that they have went for the most stolen for that particular kind of fame. So yes, probably they have profited out of this. I mean, otherwise what else are they doing with 13 pieces of art? What, spreading it between the two of them? Most probably this has been sold somewhere on the black market to somebody again that doesn't really care about art that all that much. Or at best it has been like hung in some mobster's house. I mean, it's like, again, nobody wins in any of these stories. But I feel like if motive, if primary motive was monetary, they would have gone for the most worth. And again, you gotta keep in mind, these are clearly not people who love or respect the art. So any motive that's, you know, like we had in the previous two cases where you could be like, oh my god, they have fallen for Mona Lisa or like Scream was like possessing them. That Like both of those people were actually artists themselves, you know, one of them went to buy Munch like in his later life, the other one was an artist themselves and then they were like, oh my god, like I'm storing Mona Lisa and preserving it for two years. In this case, this just looked like a job with like different messages here and there. So the conclusion of that is not all art heists are done by people who generally love and respect art. In this case, it might be just somebody who is into becoming famous for all the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. Don't go for that type of fame, my friend. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna continue and go boozing. This is the case of the Isabella Stewart Gardner robbery heist, whatever you wanna call it. Next week we are on to a random topic again and boy, boy, you are not ready. You 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 have not seen this one coming. Now on to the new and infamous on the spot section of the podcast. Actually, before going to on the spot, something that crossed my mind because I'm again reading another book by John Douglas, who was the FBI agent that interviewed like a ton of serial killers. So this one is called Killer Across the Table or in Mind Hunter that the actual show is based on. And I was thinking of it now doing these art heists this month because I was like, okay, cool, did I crack on the motivation? Because this case just confused me. I was like, in the other two, people respected art, you know, they had some fascination to it. You could actually say it was maybe even reverse Stockholm. And in this one, I was like, what was these people's problem? And John Douglas, like, for, you know, the murders and, like, serial killers and everything that he has investigated, would always say, like, if you know the what and you know the why, you will find the who. So my smart ass immediately went, well, well, we know the why and we, we know the what, we know exactly what happened. And then I thought, but we, we don't. We can only speculate. 
on both the why done it and we don't even really know what happened in one of the rooms at this museum. There are definitely gaps in this story. And honestly, it probably will never be answered because, again, we don't have the fingerprints, we just don't have the physical evidence that would have cleared somebody or where we could find somebody guilty after like a hundred years. I just thought that's important to run it because, again, like this is coming from the FBI agents and it kind of speaks to like why the motive is important in finding the perpetrators for the crime. Because again, you identify that wrongly and then you are on a completely different trail. Kind of like what I think actually happened here. Everybody was like, no, this is definitely like a monetary gain. And then they focused on the different mafia people in Boston, which are obviously deeply rooted. And there are hundred people connected to this mafia. Yeah, it's great shitting on other people when you're an armchair detective, isn't it? So, on the spot, this week. So for on the spot, every now and then, I'm gonna clue you in on what I do on YouTube and you can always watch the visuals as well. So this past week for the criminology one-on-one, -on -one, which is basically where I kind of teach you what I've learned on my masters, but like I start from most interesting topics and then go downhill. There I've done this video on super recognizers. So let's just listen to the main chunk of that. So what are super recognizers all about? As you probably guess from the name, they recognize things pretty well. What do they recognize? What's the missing word? Faces. So let's say you watching this, yeah? You, particularly you, don't turn around. You are a criminal, right? You have done something bad, like everybody's chasing and the police is after you. But you're like really good at escaping. However, you are continuing with your life. You are taking YouTube, you are appearing on CCTV because CCTV is everywhere now. So, you know, your face is still here and there. Even though you're really good at your face and disguising yourself, you can't really disguise your facial features, right? But you're pretty, you think you're pretty safe. You dyed your hair, you're putting like caps on, you're covering yourself with hoods. You're like, nobody's gonna get me. Wrong. Wrong. As much as you're trying to hide, let's say I'm within 1-2% to two percent of the population that can recognize a face just by looking at it. It doesn't matter actually at what age I look at your face. Say I looked at your high school picture and now you're like 22 years old, I can probably still recognize it even though you think you have changed so much. That means if I spot your face on any of the CCTV cameras that I have the access to because me as a super recognizer, I also most probably work for the Met Police, you're done. You are busted. We caught you, we know your patterns now, we learn where you live. That's it. You're done. Don't commit crime. That was the lesson. Now let's snap out of this imaginary world and actually talk about super recognizers. Because if you're watching this, you and I are probably within like 98% of the population who can only remember 20% of the faces you've seen. Like with me, sometimes I see somebody from high school, I'm like, that might or might not be that person. <laughs> but i known them when they were grown. But if you were to have these skills and you were a super recognizer, you actually can successfully recognize about 80% of the faces you see. That's insane. That's some insane skills. If your first thought is how have I never heard about this, it's not a pretty new term, but kind of still is. It was coined actually in 2009. Not that these people didn't exist before then, but it was only studied and researched and kind of coined in 2009 by Harvard and UCL college researchers. And obviously why this is useful, well, you could tell probably from what I was telling you, mostly super recognizers work for the Met. So they work for the police, they work in research, they work on how can we improve and actually recognize people. Because as we know, CCTV can be faulty. As I was mentioning, you could be hiding your face underneath a cap and the CCTV won't spot you because they can't just move from every single angle. Some of them are still grainy. Some shops have policy to delete CCTV footage after, let's say, 30 days. So obviously this kind of skill is super useful to the police. To put it into perspective, there's this guy that I read an interview on that works with the police. His name is Andy Pope. He has actually successfully identified 1,000 suspects within five years. Do you know how helpful that is? And he is the one that says like he can see a picture of somebody, let's say in high school, and now they're like 30 years of age, and he can recognize the person. So in his case, for example, where other police officers would have to wait for a suspect to re-offend to make a request, for him, 
that skill is helpful because he can see somebody that he can remember if he saw your picture and now he sees you. But also is the fact that he can remember a face for a long time. So once he recognizes a suspect he has seen two years prior. So just imagine how useful that is. If he can have the memory of like two years up until now of like every face he has seen, you stand no chance. And this is obviously the human touch that's particularly useful because computers just wouldn't have this kind of memory. To put this into perspective again, in 2011 London had London riots, so people were heavily looking for riot suspects. The super recognizers managed to recognize the third of 4,000 suspects, and this is after reviewing 200,000 hours of the footage. Mainly the computers failed here and only recognized one suspect because of the grainy footage, but again it just goes to show technology can be faulty and how useful these people can be to the police. Now if you're looking at this and you're like, oh man, I can't recognize, you know, even like my parents from their high school pictures. But just in general, if you're listening to this, you're like, well, I think I'm on the other end of the spectrum. I think like I'm really bad at recognizing faces. Well, in that case you might, but this again would be super rare, as rare as if you were the super recognizer. You might be in the 2 to 2.5% of the people that have the opposite, which is developmental prosopagnosia. So that's when you were just really terrible at recognizing faces, but it's not due to like any brain damage or poor eyesight. Now, how would you test something like this? There's multiple tests, but the two that I'm gonna talk about today because they're the most commonly used. First test is called before they were famous. So you might have done this probably online and at some point even maybe without knowing it or you might have done something similar where it was like hey recognize famous people childhood pictures and they would give you about 56 photographs of people before they were famous but it's usually their childhood pictures. So you're either to say well to choose their name and to recognize who the person is or to just be able to generally describe them. Because you know, again, sometimes you might not remember the name, however you will be like, oh, is that actress from that movie, kind of thing. So as long as you are able to generally describe them and be like, yeah, they appeared in XYZ, that still kind of counts as recognition. Second is the Cambridge face memory test. Here you're given six male faces and all of them have been given to you in like three different profiles. So let's say this, this, left, right. And now you have different tasks. So at first you're given those six male faces from those three angles that you have seen, so it starts off easy, but then you have to recognize those faces, you know, just from them as like actually walking the street, like different lighting, and then it gets harder and harder. Obviously, if you were to, let's say, pass that test with flying colors and suddenly you were like, oh my god, I can actually recognize faces pretty quickly, then they would go and actually give you different tasks. Because they're looking for you to recognize and not have perceptions about the face recognitions. So what does that mean is, again, like, people tend to try to generalize, right? So you would see one face and you would compare it to like five others and be like, that's the same person. So that's the trick. So afterwards, once you prove yourself to have like exceptional face recognizing skills, then they would go and move on and see, like, are you able not to discriminate between the simultaneously presented faces? So obviously for best practice, there is a couple of ways to do it. So let's say you are to identify a suspect and you're being shown a bunch of photographs, right? Obviously nobody should give you any insinuations, they should, it should be in a controlled environment and they should just give you like the photographs to look at. And then what the people should pay attention to is, well, for how long can you recognize the person? Can you recognize them on different days? Can you recognize them on, among other faces? So, hence why lineups, for example, should be people kind of like all of a similar height, similar looks, exactly because of that, so that there are no mistakes made. And I find this one really funny because like, when you think about it, it's so logical. But usually it's easier but also more reliable for you to recognize averaged images of a standard face shape. What does that mean? If you were to see me in town now after watching this YouTube video, you will most probably recognize me better than if you were to just see my passport picture and be like, eh. Because again, there's something that's more reliable when seeing averaged images with like different shadows and everything rather than just a standard face shape. And to reiterate again, it's really useful to have these people working for border control, for example. So like those people are kind of actually exposed to these tests, like people working for the police, let's say transport police, 
or just met in general. Just because obviously what you're thinking about is trying to, well, not have the false negative, more importantly not have the false positive. So false negative would mean like negatively identifying somebody's face, which means you have let somebody pass through the cracks and you haven't actually caught the suspect or the witness or whoever. But false positive is even worse because if you have people who can't actually recognize faces but they are convinced that they have recognized the right ones, so those people are obviously not super recognizers, they can be somebody like me who is again basing it on the perception of like what I have about how those people look like. Well, then you have a false positive and then you have basically caught the wrong person and it can lead to miscarriages of justice. Now, if you're still watching this video and you're like, I'm like really bad at this smile, like, and you don't even understand, just like find it intriguing. Well, actually, Josh Davis that taught me at Greenwich University, say hi to Josh if you're still there. He is such a character. By the way, if Josh is teaching you at Greenwich still, does he still do that thing where, well, he makes people do the test, but he does it in such a way as if he's like scouting for the super recognizers and then he's like super proud of you if you are dead and thinks that you're gonna go and do PhD in that and research for him? Yeah, just, Josh is such a character. I just love Josh so much. Also, he just has the best picture for this research. Like, how cool is this picture? I want this picture. <laughs> then I don't have the skills, so hey. So, in his study in 2011, he has actually concluded that sometimes the prosopagnosia or just in general not being able to recognize people as well as you can, well, can stem from the poor eyesight, can stem from other things, but it's usually social anxiety. So, let's say if you are a really shy person and you have been avoiding eye contact with other people your whole life, well, then in that case, it can actually lead to you not being able to recognize the faces as good as other people. And that's simply because you had less practice at looking at faces and as such at recognizing those faces. And if you are intrigued more into the prosopagnosia and you think like maybe you are actually on the other end of the spectrum, kind of check if it's interesting, kind of check like how do you react to even pictures of people. If even pictures of people make you kind of uncomfortable, you can't even look at the eyes of the people in the pictures, maybe like test yourself to see if you are actually on the other end of the spectrum. There's nothing wrong with it. Just saying like I found that super interesting because those people with that diagnosis actually realize that even just looking at pictures, they're like, I get nothing. Now we're gonna go take a test, well, probably a couple of tests, like um, they're on the Greenwich page, I'll put the link down below so you can take it with me as we are going along. One thing, if you do take a test and you score 10 and above or just like in general you score really well, you know, where to go from there, I'll again put some links below, you can obviously participate in research, you can actually contact Josh Davies and like other people at Greenwich Uni, or there are different departments, like London Met has people dedicated to just looking at CCTV footage, so they have a team of super recognizers. Scotland Yard has about, I think, 200 super recognizers. Their jobs, their research websites, so you can just get involved in the research in general. So, yeah, I gotcha. Let's put the grandma glasses on and get this test going. Wasn't that interesting? Like, I found that to be the most interesting thing when I've done, like, criminology and criminal psychology. As my master's, you guys probably know, I've done journalism as the BA. It's that weird combo of life. <laughs> and honestly, I respect super recognizers, but I'm also kind of, like, really scared of how can somebody just recognize that many features? How can somebody just, like, see my picture from when I was a kid and see it now and be like, yeah, that's it. I'll link the video to that down below if you wanna, you know, go and watch me there, subscribe, because then I'll do those every Wednesday. And, you know, support the girl across, across all feeds, across all threads. <laughs> but honestly, I love kilting the episode like this. I'm like, yeah, here's a bit of this, here's a bit of this, let's comment on it. So let me know if you've done the test and if you have actually discovered whether you are a super agonizer or if you are that propagnosiac person who is actually, like, on the complete opposite of the spectrum. But now, God, I'm almost pushing this to like the Dahmer episode length. And there's definitely no reason for it. So, a bit of context here for your next Zoom call slash meeting. This conversation, I don't know, keeps popping up to me this week. I mean, it kind of does in general just because it pissed me off so much. Basically, I had a conversation with my manager when I worked for the office. And you know, when I was leaving, I was like, yeah, giving that feedback. And I said, basically, since my research into the company and then after joining and everything, I was like, this company just is 
the whitest place ever. Like, why aren't we hiring people of race? And she said, well, we hire based on merit. And I was like, okay, so for for this role, right? For the role that you just opened, how many black people have you interviewed? She just went quiet. I was like, okay, well, that just tells you all, doesn't it? You can't be telling people bullshit that you hire on merit when you don't offer opportunities in the first place. It reminds me so much of the Enchufe or just like back home. A connection and then... Yeah, I guess a connection is a word in English. You have a connection and then you ask somebody, it's like, oh, how did they get a job? And if that person answers upon merit, it'd be like, they were the only applicant though. They were like the only person interviewed. So how can you say it's upon merit? It was clearly a link to you, freak. So you can bet your ass I fed that back and then I left a glass door review about it, so yeah, great. So in your next Zoom call, just uh, start the awkward conversations of Hey, you know this current role, whatever role you have going on in the company? Have you interviewed like people of race? You know, how, how many people? Is it equal balance? Why is it not if not? And what can we do about it? Because honestly, it's the people that tell you stuff like this, like, yeah, we are hiring upon merit. They also don't want to be left in those uncomfortable situations where they don't know how to speak to people of race. They genuinely don't know what conversations to start. They're like, the culture is so different. And then they choose to isolate themselves in their own bubble and be like, yeah, listen, this doesn't touch me. As long as I can provide with some excuse, we don't need diversity. There are multiple all white companies out there. There's nothing wrong with that. While there's everything wrong with that, especially in this time, especially when people are looking for jobs during COVID. And well, in questioning, is your manager simply a racist? Or at best, are they just about educating themselves on things like Black Lives Matter, but then not ever having to put theory into practice? Well, first of all, think about that, because you're either racist or an anti-racist. But secondly, start speaking about it. And in doing so, making the world a better place. One motive at a time. What a note to end it on, Maya. What a note. Happy Monday, fuckers. Until next one, see you later.